The Railway Children, Chapter 8, The Amateur Fireman. The extra likely little, li- lo- likely little bronze you got that on, miss, said Perks, the bolter. I don't know if it's ever seen a thing more like a buttercup. But it was a buttercup. Yes, said Bobby, glad and flushed by his approval. I always thought it more like a buttercup, almost than a real one. I never thought it would be mine, my very own. And then Mother gave it to me for my birthday. Oh, have you had a birthday? said Perks, who was quite surprised. He seemed quite surprised, as though a birthday were a thing only God into favour with you. Yes, said Bobby. When is your birthday, Mr. Perks? The children were making tea with Mr. Perks in the porter's room, among the lamps and the railway arrax. They brought their cup, own cups and some jam turnovers. Mr. Perks made tea in a beer can, as usual, and everyone felt very happy and confidential. My birthday, said Perks, tipping some more dirt, deep, dark brown tea out of the can into Peter's cup. We keep up keeping, I give up keeping my birthday before you was born. But you must have been born sometime, you know, said Phyllis Farrett thoughtfully. Even if it was twenty years ago, or thirty or sixty or seventy. Not so long as that, Missy, Perks grinned as he answered. If you really want to know, it was thirty-two years ago, come the fifteenth of this month. Then why didn't you keep? Didn't why did you keep it? Said Mister Phyllis. Well, I got, I got someone else to keep besides birthdays. Said Perks briefly. Oh, what? Asked Phyllis eagerly. Not secrets. No, said Perks. The kids and the misses. In this t- talk, they set the children thinking, and presently talking, Perks was on the whole the dearest friend they had made. Not so grand as a station master, but more approachable, less powerful than the old gentleman, but more confidential. It seems horrid that nobody keeps his birthday, said Bobby. Can't we do something? Let's go up to the canal bridge and talk o- over, said Peter. I got a new gut line for the postman this morning. He gave it to me with a bunch of roses that I gave for a bunch of roses that I gave him for his sweetheart. She's ill. Then I do think you might have given her the butt roses for nothing, said Bobby indignantly. Nick nag, said Peter disagreeably, and put his hands in his pockets. You did, a, you did, of course, said Phyllis in haste. Directly we heard she was ill. We we got the roses ready and waited by the gate. It's when you were making the brekkie toast. When he said thank you for the roses so many times, much more than he needed to have, he pulled out the line and gave it to Peter. It wasn't a, a sta- it wasn't a strange, it was a grateful heart. Oh beg your pardon, Peter, said Bobby. I am sorry, don't mention it, said Peter grandly. I knew you would be. So then they all went up to the canal bridge. The idea was a fish for the page. But the line was not quite long enough. Never mind, said Bobby. Let's just stay here and look at the things. Everything is so beautiful. It was there. It was. The sun was settling in red splendour over the grey in the purple hills. The canal lay smooth and shining in the shadow to rip. No ripple spoke its surface. It was like a grey satin ribbon between the dusky green silk and the meadows that were on each side of its banks. It's all right, said Peter, but somehow I can always see how pretty things are much better than a, something I have something to do. Let's get down on the towpath and fish from there. For this and Bobby remembered how the boys in the canal boats had thrown coal at them, and they did so. Oh, nonsense, said Peter. There are not any boys on now. If there were, I'd fight them. Peter's sisters were kind enough not to remind him how he had not fought the boys with coal at last been thrown. He said they said, all right then. And cautiously climbed down the steep bank to the towing road path. The line was carefully baited, and for half an hour they fished patiently. In vain, not a single nibble came the farish hope in their hearts. My I, all eyes were intent on the sluggish waters, and earnestly pretended they never harboured a single minnow. When a round, rough shout made them start. Here, said the shout in the most agreeable tones, get out of that, that. 
Ten minutes, can't you? An old horse, white horse coming along the tide path was within half a dozen yards of them. I sprang to the feast hastily, walked, climbed up the bank. We slipped down again when they'd gone by, said Bobby. But alas, the barge, uh, after the manual barges, stopped on the bridge. She's going on to anchor, said Peter. Just our luck, the barge did not anchor, because an anchor is not part of a canal boat's furniture. She was moored with ropes, floor and aft, and the ropes were made fast to the palings to the crossbars. Crowbars driven to the ground. What you staring at? growled the barge crossly. We wasn't staring, said Bobby. We wouldn't be so rude. Rude be blessed, said the man. Get along with you. Get along get along yourself, said Peter. You remember that he had said about fighting boys in a size felt safe halfway up the bank. We might there was as much right here as anybody else. Oh, have you indeed, said the man. We'll soon see about that. Came across his deck and began to climb down the side of his barge. Oh, come away, Peter, come away, said Bobby. Felix in a agonised unison. unison. Not me, said Peter. No, you, you, but you better. The girl climbed to the top of the bank and stood ready to bolt for home. As soon as he saw their brother out of danger, the way home lay all downhill. They knew they all ran well. Abaji did not look as if he did. He had a fresh face, heavy and beefy. But as soon as his foot was on the towing bar, the children saw he had much judged him. He made one spring up to the bank and caught Peter by the leg, dragging him down and set him on his feet with a shake. So she took him on here and said to Daddy, Now then, what do you mean by it? Don't you know the area of water is preserved? There ain't no right catching fish here, not to say nothing of our precious creek, which I was always proud of. Afterwards, that's it, when he remembered that, with the barges threw his fingers tightening on his feet here, the barges crimson countenance close to his own, the barges hot breath on his neck. He had the courage to speak the truth. I wasn't catching fish, said Peter. That's not your fault, our fault. I'll be bound, said the man, giving Peter's ear a twist. Not a whole one, but still a twist. Peter could not say what it, that it was Bobby uh, Phyllis been holding on the railings above and skipping with anxiety. Now suddenly Bobby slipped through the railings, rushed down the bank towards Peter, so imperiously that Phyllis, following May temperately, felt certain that her sister's ascent would end in the waters of the canal, and so it would have been done if Vargie hadn't let go of Peter's ear and caught her with his jer- jersey on. Well, who are you shoving off? he said, setting her on her feet. Oh, said Bobby deliberately, I'm not shoving anybody, at least not on purpose. Please don't be cross with Peter. Of course it's not, it's your canal. We're sorry, we wouldn't want any more. But we didn't know it was yours. Go along with you, said Bargy. Yes, we will, indeed we will, said Bobby earnestly. But we do beg your pardon, really we have caught a single fish. I'll tell you directly if we had. On a break, I would. They held out her hands and Phyllis turned out a little, a little empty pocket to show that it really wasn't any fish concealed about him. Well, said the bargee more gently, come along then, and don't you go do it, do it again, that's all. Children hurried up to the bank. Chuck us a coat, Mara, shouted the man. Red-haired woman, a green plaided shawl, came out from the cabin door with a baby in arms and threw a coat to him. He put it on and climbed the bank and slouched along across the bridge towards the village. You find me at the Rose and Crown when you've got the kids to sleep, he called to her from the bridge. When he was out of sight, the children slowly returned. Peter insisted on this. The cow may belong to him, he said, though I don't believe it does, but the bridge is everybody's. Dr. Folder, Dr. Forrest told me it's public property. I'm not going to be bounced off a bridge by him or anywhere else, else so I tell you. Peter is still sore, and so are his feelings. The girls followed him as gallant soldiers might follow the leader of a lone hope. I do wish you wouldn't, was all they said. Go home if you're afraid, said Peter. Leave me alone. I'm not afraid. The sound of the man's footsteps died away. Along the quiet road, the peace of the evening was not broken. But the notes of sedge warbles or the voice of the woman in the barge singing to the baby to sleep. It was a sad song she sung, something about Bill Belly and how she wanted 
him to come home. The children stood, stood leaning their arms on the parapet of the bridge. They were glad to be quiet for a few minutes before, because all three hearts were beating much more quickly. I'm not going to be driven away by an old bargeman. I'm not, said Peter thickly. Of course not, Phyllis said about smoothly. You don't give it in to him. So now we might go home, don't you think? No, said Peter. Nothing more than has said. Till the, the woman got off the bars, climbed the bank, and looked, came across the bridge. She hesitated among looking at the three backs of children. Then she said, Ahem. Peter stayed as he was, but the girls looked round. You don't, I mustn't take no notice of my bill, said the woman. It's Bayok's worth to the boy. Some of the children down for early way is fair terrors. It will put him, it will beat up back up, calling out where it, the pu- 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 puppy boy on the Varna Bridge. Who did it? said asked Phillips. Well, I don't know, said the woman. Nobody you know, don't know it. Don't know. But somehow, I don't know the boy or no for where for of it. Then where is his prison? Treason to my board, was that? Don't you take no notice. He won't be back for two hours good. You might catch a parrot or a fish before that. But it's good, you know, she added. Thank you, said Bobby. You're very kind. Where's your baby? We're asleep in the cabin, said the woman. He's all right. Never awakes before after twelve. Regular as a church clock he is. I'm sorry, said Bobby. I would have liked to have seen him up close to. Well, a finer you never did see. Miss the wise says it. The woman's face brightened as she spoke. I'm afraid you aren't you afraid to leave it, said Peter. Oh love you no, said the woman. Who hurt a little thing like him? Besides, Potsy in her so long. The woman went away. Shall we go on? said Phyllis. You can, I'm going to fish, said Peter Birdley. I thought we came here up here to talk about Perk's birthday, said Phyllis. Perk's birthday keep or oh, keep. So they got down on the bath again, and Peter fished. He did not catch anything. It was almost quite dark. The girls were getting tired. As Bobby said, it's past bedtime. When suddenly Phyllis cried, What's that? She cried, pointed the cup of boat, canal boat. Smoke was coming from the chimney of the, of the cabin. And indeed, began been curling softly. It's a soft evening air all the time. But now, up reached the smoke were rising. And they were from the cabin door. It's on fire, that's all, said Peter calmly. Serve him right. Oh, can, how can you, cried Phyllis. Think of the poor dear old dog. A baby screamed Bobby. For an instant, all three made... In an instant, all three made for the barge. A mooring ropes of slack, a little breeze, hardly strong enough to be felt, had yet been strong enough to drift her stern against the bank. Bobby was first, and came Peter. It was Peter who slipped and fell. He went into the canal up to his neck, and his feet could not feel the bottom. But his arm was on the edge of the barge. Phyllis caught at his hair. It hurt, but it helped him get out. Next minute, he had leaped on the barge. Phyllis following. Not you, he shouted to Bobby. Me, because I'm wet. He went up, caught up with Bobby at the curve into the floor and flung her aside very roughly indeed. If he had been playing such roughness, it would have made Bobby weak with tears of rage and pain. Now, though, no, he flung her on the edge of the hold so that her knee and elbow were grazed and bruised. She only cried, No, not you, me, and struggled up again. Not but not quickly enough. Peter had already gone down to the cabin steps, into the cloud of thick smoke. He stopped, remembered all he had ever heard of fires, pulled his snow handkerchief out of his breast pocket, and tied it all over his mouth. As he pulled it out, he said, It's all right, hardly any fire at all. And this, though, he thought was a lie. It was a rather good of Peter. It meant to keep Bobby from rushing after him to danger. Of course, it didn't. The cabin growed red, a paraffin lamp that was burning calmly in an orange mist. Hi, said Peter, lifting handkerchief from his mouth for a moment. Hi, baby, where are you? he choked. Oh, let's me go, said Bobby, close behind him. Peter pushed her back more roughly, and then before went on. Now then what would happen if a baby hadn't cried? I don't know. But it just at that moment it did cry. Peter felt his way around through the bark smoke, around found something small, soft and warm and alive, picked it up and backed out, nearly trembling over Bob, 
tumbling over Bobby, who was close behind. The dog snapped at his leg, tried to bark, joked. I got the kid, said Peter, tearing off a handkerchief and staring onto the deck. Bobby caught out at the place where the bark came from. Our hands met on the fat back of the smooth head dog. It turned and fastened its teeth on the head, but very gently, as much to do as say, I bound a bark and bite, bite if strangers more coming to my master's cabin, but I know you mean well, so I won't, don't, I won't really bite. Bobby dropped the dog. All right, old man, good dog, she said. Here, give me the baby, Peter. You're so wet, you'll give it a cold. But he was only too glad to hand over the strange little bundle that squirmed and whimpered in his arms. Now, said Bobby, quickly, you run straight to the rose and crown and tell Phil, and I'll stay here with a precious hush. Then, our oh, dear oh, darling, go now, Peter, run. I can't run in these things, said Peter firmly. They're as heavy as lead, I'll walk. Then I'll run, said Bobby. Get on the bank, Phil, and hand you, you hand, I hand you the deer. The baby was carefully handed. Phyllis sat down on the bank and tried to hush the baby. Peter rang the water from his sleeves and knickerbockered legs as well as he could. It was Bobby who ran like the wind across the bridge, up along the quiet, quiet twilight road towards the Rose and Crown. It's a nice old-fashioned room at the Rose and Crown, where barges and their wives sit at an evening drinking a super supper beer, a toasting their supper cheese, a glowing basket full of coals that sticks out in the room. On the great hooded chimney, it is warmer and prettier and more comforting than any other fireplace I've ever saw. There was a pleasant party of barge people round the fire. You might not have thought it pleasant, but they did for they were all friends or acquaintances. They liked the same sort of things and talked the same sort of talk. This is a real secret of pleasant society. A Vargy Bill, who the children had found so disagreeable, was considered excellent company by his mates. He was telling a tale of his wrong wrongs, always a thrilling subject. It was his barge he was in, he's speaking about. Oh no, he sent them down, word paint, and or about oh, not naming so colour is this he. So I gets a little of green paint, a piece of stone to stone. I tell you, she look like <coughs> I want, look a one. Then he comes along and says, "Oh, your paint, <coughs> oh, what colour for?" He says, "Oh, he says, 'Cause well, I thought she looked fair as fur free." Says I, and I think still do, think still, still, still. And he says, "Do you no do ye?" Then he can just pay for the blooming paint yourself, says he. I was all he don't know to. A moment of sympathy ran round the room, breaking noisily to a cut of it. Breaking noisily into it came Bobby. He burst open the swing door, crying breathlessly. Bill, I'm on by the old bargeman. The bargeman. There was a silence, supervised silence. Pots of beer were held in midair, paralysed and way to thirsty mouths. Oh, said Bobby. Seeing the barge woman and making for her. Your cabin's. The barge cabin's on fire. Go quickly. <coughs> <coughs> the woman started up to her feet and put a red hand to her half waist on the left side where her heart seems to be when you are frightened or miserable. Reginald Horace, she cried in a variable voice. My Reginald Horace. All right, said Bobby. It's me, if you mean the baby. Got him out safe. Dog too, she said. I had no breath for more. I said, go on, it's all right. He sank to the floor, ale floor's bench, then tried to get the breath of relief. The running which people called the second wind, but he felt as rough, though she'd never breathe again. Bill the Bargy rose slowly and heavily, but his wife was a hundred years up, yards up the road, for he quite understood what was the matter. Phyllis, shivering by the canal side, hardly heard a quick reproach. She fleet before the woman had flung herself on the railing, rolled down the bank and snatched the baby from her. Don't, said Phyllis reproachfully. I just got him to sleep. Bill came up looking later, talking in a language with the children were wholly unfamiliar. He leaped onto the barge and dipped up pails of water. Peter helped him. They put out the fire. Phyllis, the barge woman, the baby, presently Bobby, too, curled together in a heap on the bank. Lord, help me. If it, weren't, if it was me left anything that's called a fire, 
to the woman again and again. But it wasn't she. It was Bill the Bargeman, who had knocked his pipe out of red ash and fallen on the heath rug, and smothered it there, at last, last broken into flame. Through it stern, though a stern man as he was, just. He did not blame his wife for what he, that for what is his own fault, and many bargemen and other men, too, would have done. Mother and half wild with anxiety, when at last the three children turned up the three chimneys, all very wet by now, but Peter seemed to come off on the, off on the others. But when she had disentangled the truth of what had happened from their mixed and incurrent narrative, she owed that they had done quite right, and could not possibly have done otherwise. Nor did she put any obstacles in the way for their accepting the cordial invasion of which the bargemen had parted from them. Here, be here at seven tomorrow, he said. Or I'll take you a toy trip to Furley and back. As I will, not a penny to pay. Not even larks. They did not know what locks were, but they were at the bridge at seven, with bread and cheese and half a soda cake, and quite a quarter of leg and mutton in a basket. It was a glorious day, the old white horse strained to the ropes, the barge guided smoothly and rough, steadily through the still water. The sky was blue overhead. Mr. Bill was nice as anyone could possibly be. No one could have thought he would could be the same man that Pete held Peter by the ear. And so Mrs. Bill, she'd always been nice, as Bobby said, and so had the baby, and even Spot, who might have bitten them quite badly if he had liked, if he had liked. It'd been, it was simply ripping, Mother, said Peter, that when they reached home very, very, very happy, very tired and very dirty, right after glorious uh, outgrowth, Doug, Lux, you don't, you don't know what they like. You sink in the ground and then you feel that you're never going to stow down, going down, not going down. Two great black lock gates soon open slowly, slowly. You go out and, they, and there you are, a canal, just like you were before. I know, said Mother. There are locks at the Thames. Father and I used to go to the, on the river at Marlow before we were married. And the dear darling ducky baby, said Bobby. It, we let, let, it let me nurse it for ages, ages. So good, Mother. I wish we had a baby to play with. And everyone was so nice to us, said Phyllis. Everyone we met, they say that we may fish whenever we like. And Bill was going to show us his way next time in his parts he says he doesn't he says we don't really know we don't know really he said you don't know said peter but mother he said we tell us barges up and down the well, we are the real red the right sort and they were to treat us like good pals as we were so then i said but it's interrupted we can always wear a red ribbon we went fishing upon the canal and so you know it was us we are real, right, still right, right, and be nice to us. You made another lot of friends, said Mother. First of all, in the canal. Oh, yes, said Bobby. I think everyone in the world is friends. If you only get get them to see, you don't want to be unfriends. Perhaps you're right, said Mother. She sighed, came, come, chicks, it's bedtime. Yes, said Phyllis, my dear. We went up there to talk about what we'll do for Perk's birthday. We, ha- we haven't talked a single thing about it. No more, no more we have, said Bobby. But Peter saved Reginald Horace's life. I think that's about good enough for one evening. Bobby, would you, would you have saved him if it had not turned down twice? I said, uh, I not turned down twice. I did, said Peter loyally. Yeah, oh, yes, I would, said Phyllis. If I know what to do, yes, said Mother. You saved a little child's life. I do think that's enough for one evening. Oh, darling, thank God you're safe. All right, think, oh my darling, thank God, you're all safe.